I mean, I, I, honestly, it's, it's never happened to me before. I read an article and that was it. I just know oh, that's, I'm doing that. Athletes need role models. Like anyone, they need people to look up to. So, Bennett, I kind of want to start with where we started um, on Friday, mm -hmm. interviewing the cast. Mm -hmm. I threw out um, as my first question, uh, the mm -hmm. first kind of theme that I want to talk about, explore, was this, you know, the, the presence of America in the film mm -hmm. in different ways. Mm -hmm. The film throws it into your face the whole fucking way through. Mark, we as a nation have failed to honor you. I want to see this country soar again. It does put its sights on uh, a number of themes that might be particularly dynamic in our country, but not with the intention of um, Making commenting. Making a statement or commenting. Uh, yeah, and in fact, by not commenting, um, hopefully it permits some uh, access past where we would normally get when we you know, succumb to the temptation to conclude. Within this little story, uh, you find in the, the nucleus of it, you know, some of these themes that might be distinctly mm -hmm. or maybe especially American that have to do with wealth and class and entitlement and exceptionalism and things like that. But it's not about um, condemning one side or the other. It's 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 mostly just a film, you right. know. It's it's a it's a story. You know, it's based on a true story, and with the actors and the writers. And uh, but let me ask you about that because not only is it John Dupont that's like decorating his whole fucking existence with eagles and flags right. and guns right. and tr tanks and stuff. But Mark, when he first comes back and talks to Dave, his brother, he's like, this guy was pulling this shit out of my brain, man. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm thinking all these things. I yeah. think America is sliding backwards. I think we need valor and honor and all mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. stuff. So maybe it's not political, but mm -hmm. it's like, a psychodrama, mm -hmm. but America is a character, so what's the character? Well, I mean, everything you just said is, is true, and it's right, and e even as you're saying that, I'm reminded of this other theme and interest, which is how it happens sometimes that people come to vote against their own interests, and, you know, how do they get sucked into something, and what, what is that common ground, uh, which often does involve this sort of language and you know, symbolism and ideologies that permit people from absolutely different um, walks of life. How is it that they can come together? It's another theme of the film of um, people who are so different, uh, feeling mm -hmm. like they belong to each other, uh, trying to fit together in really untenable relationships, but having mm -hmm. uh, a, a mythology, like a co-authored mythology mm -hmm. that permits them to be. One of the wealthiest guys in America has these, some of the most talented wrestlers move on to his estate. And um, what is that transaction? You know, what, what did these guys have that DuPont wanted? Coach DuPont has a vision. He would like Foxcatcher to be the official training site for the national team. It's very easy to just jump to quick conclusions and simplify it, but as I researched this story over some years, it's, it's, of course it's not that right. simple. What about the research? for the project, like how did this become the thing that would 
you know, take you so long to do? I mean, I, I honestly, it's, it's never happened to me before. I read an article and that was it. I just, oh, that's, I'm doing that. You know, without knowing much about it, I just... Gut. I, I was so intrigued and um, to be honest, there's there's a part of it that was just humorous. You know, this the idea of these of this rich guy with these wrestlers living on his estate, his enormous estate, larger than Central Park. You know, with yeah. a fence around it, yeah. and he knew nothing about wrestling. And the setup is something that could have very easily been turned into a comedy. Right, if I was going to say tragic. that. Yeah, yeah. So, so, but what interested you? Because you weren't going to turn it into a comedy. First of all, there was this absurdist humor part of like these two worlds. I was interested in the oddity of both worlds, like the wrestling world and what's that about, and also of you know the super wealthy old money in this country. But uh, again, you know. The transaction, what were these guys doing down there? And the fact that it ended horribly. Another thing, and maybe this is just a personal thing, but perhaps it's also an Americana theme since we're talking about it, is people being in worlds where they do not belong and, right. and not realizing it, you know, and finding ways to convince themselves and others that this makes sense right. and that we do fit. And the concept of America and what it means to people the kind of self-deception and mutual deception that has to occur, I think, for us to believe we're talking about the same thing, like America, as if that, as if it can be reduced into some simple notion. But you're basically saying any attempt to kind of mythologize mm -hmm. something like America into, I don't know, a structure that's like never changing and mm -hmm. ahistorical and, you know, uh, that that's wrong and that that ca characters but I'm not saying you're interested in that because you're trying to be a political scientist with this film but I'm saying that maybe that 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 is there and behind this film and you're interested in how people kind of actively try and create uh, those mythologies on a daily you know basis with the people that they interact with honestly the fo the the shot in your film that really kind of fucked me up the most was that one shot, the insert of Washington crossing the Delaware. Mm -hmm. Why is that there in, in Mark's life? Well, I mean, there, I mean, I think it's, it's what we're talking about. It's, it's, the, it's the common ground um, between these classes, right. these forms of consciousness, that the iconography is the same. Yeah. And that this means something to me and it, the same thing means something to you. And maybe we can, can be confused enough to uh, believe that it means the, the same, same thing, thing to both, to of, both us. of us. Right. And there's also themes beneath it, meaning George Washington is some kind of a father figure. Right. And he was one of the founding fathers. Right. And these men are patriots. Yeah. And DuPont himself is a patron. Right. And these people, in fact, um, it did not have fathers. They both right. saw their fathers split when they were two years old. Mm -hmm. Which is DuPont. DuPont. Dead. Uh, what happened? He, he he left. He just left. He he left for another woman. And Mark and Dave Schultz's parents split when Mark was two, and so no father. As, as much as a founding father is Americana, there's also just that personal thing. And, and again, the, it's not ultimately the political thing that, that you're grabbing at, no. but, but it's, it, it's, it's, it. but it's, the, it's the, it, there's a relationship between um, you know, the truth of who we are behind all of uh, these beliefs and yeah. what, our, what our conditioning drives might be and the appeal of these things and the complications and the messiness uh, that might lead us uh, to be attracted mm -hmm. to um, some of these ideas. Did you, in your research, find that speech where Mark says, he's my father-like figure? 
I spent my lifetime looking for a father, and I have found one in John DuPont. Yes, he says I've been searching for father figure all my life, and I found one in yeah. you know, John DuPont. Is that real? Is that what he? Uh, that that those words were actually written by John DuPont. Right, and I for... and I found them in a book oh, that, that he that he no. wrote. Just out of curiosity, with the whole birds and taxidermy thing. Mm -hmm is a huge, obvious reference in film history mm -hmm. to Psycho mm -hmm. and Hitchcock. Well, I suppose you'd call this his hideaway. His hobby, as you see, was taxidermy. Crow here, an owl there. When you were, you know, doing that stuff, did you think of that at all, or no? Not, no, not really. Yeah. But, um, you know, there is some measure of awareness of Hitchcock and yeah. the language of his movies. Uh, I think when they're really working at their best, um, you do not feel like these films are telling a story. You feel like they are observing a story, and right. you are not being told, and you're not just observing, you are inside someone else's head. Like watching the birds, mm -hmm. you feel, it mm -hmm. feels like consciousness. Why are they doing this? Hitchcock films often had a, like a, you know, a thriller, and then there would be like a kind of family drama, mm -hmm. kind of, especially the birds, right, is a perfect one. Mm -hmm. But in your film, the family, mm -hmm. right, is, just not existent or it is destroyed. And there are these moments um, where Dave Schultz tries to you know, embrace his brother and bring him into a family type experience. And they're always like about awkward conversations or mm -hmm. awkward hugs. There's no familial love in there. It feels like the director mm -hmm. is putting the family before Mark Schultz in a way to tease him and taunt mm -hmm. him, like, mm -hmm. you don't have this. Because Mark doesn't um, feel the draw and the appeal, to him, Dave's family is sort of a, an inconvenience to uh, his value system. Mm -hmm. You know, Mark is, is, is not focused on it. He says, uh, you know, I've got my kids here, I've got my wife here, I've got my kids here, and he's just like, well, they can come, right? <laughs> you know, like right. they're like an afterthought. Right. His, his mind's not there. I heard in an interview once. I think it was. I mean, I know it was Larry King, um, and he might have been talking to Clinton about the effect that it had on them for not having a father, because neither of these guys grew up with fathers. Right. And Larry King said. I'm paraphrasing something to the effect of, if, if you do not have a father, it's common to have two powerful, fundamental feelings. One is that anything is possible. A and the other is um, an unending anxiety. Right. You know, <laughs> and like looking over your shoulder. What was it like creating these characters? Because they're so... It, They're so, I, I they pop off yeah. as not being either of those three actors, I by did, the way. I did not create these characters. Mm -hmm. I mean, these, these people did live, and some of them still do live, and these actors, you know, did their job, and they, they, they learned these characters. But uh, it, I think it's a case of casting, not just the actors, but also the story. Right, but there's a decision um, by the director, you, mm -hmm. to create a kind of like acting language. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. Pick up the kids. Mm -hmm. You see that three times in the film. Mm -hmm. You never see him pick up the kids. Mm -hmm. So you're putting, you're creating the characters insofar as you're saying, guys, and even forget about the real people for a second, you're not going to express too much or in the way that in every other film, you not only see the guy pick up the kids, you see them walk down the sidewalk, then he gets in the car, and he does his hair, and then like, you know, um, it's like you're, you know, squeezing the, the space that these 
actors have to create characters. Mm -hmm. I think the actors did such an incredible job at um, grokking these characters and inhabiting oh, yeah. them that you don't have to see them. You don't have to see Dave Schultz picking his kids up to know that he is a caring, loving father. Mm -hmm. it, it just felt redundant to see some of this stuff. You know, there's a scene when you meet the brothers together, when you, when you see them together for the first time where they, you know, warm up and wrestle, they practice. And Amazing scene, by the way. Which is, the, yeah, the first. Long. Mm hmm And. Hardly say a word. No, yeah. A I mean, a couple of words, just random words in the beginning. And, uh, Right. When when uh, I assembled that scene and put it, you know, in a cut with all the other scenes, I realized there was about 20 minutes of scenes that had been shot that could be eliminated because those scenes existed in order to um, communicate who these guys were to each other. And it just happened that because of these actors worked the way they worked, then it was redundant. I asked the actors, um, I'm going to interview Bennett on Monday. What mm. should I know? Mm. And you know what Channing said? Mm -mm. You should know chess. Mm. And I said, why? And he's like, because that's how he worked with us. It was a game of chess. And because you're amazing at chess and that's I'm how, not I'm not oh, well, amazing he, he at thought chess. He, he thinks you're good at chess or very good at chess and it was for him um, like a glimpse into how you work they agreed that you went into this film knowing or having an image of the the dramaturgy the drama the scenes themselves mm -hmm. and sometimes the shots in your brain mm -hmm. but that you worked with them mm -hmm. and threw that kind of image out, but they all said eventually kind of where you guys ended up was very close to that image that you had or that feeling for a mm -hmm. scene. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Um, you can talk about the film that you're gonna make. You know, I'm gonna make this film and it's gonna, and this scene exists because of this and, and what we're gonna get from it is gonna be this and it's gonna feel like this and you know. But that's just a conversation. That's not that's not the scene itself. Right. That's that's sort of like the that's a description of a spirit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's not a like guiding. this lens or this yeah. that. It's it's a spirit that's that's looking to be incarnated. Mm -hmm. And so how does that happen? Like what's the process by which this thing that I could feel and maybe I could make you feel and see to a degree, but still is not material. What's the process that it becomes incarnated? And the process recruits these actors and their talents and uh, obliges them to speak for these characters. The process of incarnating it uh, did involve some exploration and there was a certain amount that we knew and there was a certain amount we had to admit that we did not know. And as much work uh, had been done over the years on the script, we, you know, with two very excellent and wise screenwriters, Dan Futterman and Max Fry, mm -hmm. still when you get there, uh, that's, part of, that's part of the process. Mm -hmm. and, and part of the ultimate authoring of the film is you know, you don't stop examining, you don't stop the exploration. And mm -hmm. so it was opened up to them. And uh, I was curious to see how something yeah. might... Um, Evolve. The, the, the scene that comes to mind right now is um, when they're on the helicopter flying to DC and the, the moment when DuPont first offers cocaine... The kid. ...to Mark Schultz. And so you have an Olympic gold medalist who is hell-bent on winning another gold for America in the Olympics that was not boycotted by the Soviets to go to the 88 Olympics. In Seoul. In Seoul, and win gold, and that's the reason he's there, and that's yep. why he was brought on, and now they're in a helicopter, and John DuPont 
takes out his cocaine kit and starts blowing lines and offers some to Mark Schultz. And why would somebody who has this aim to be an Olympic gold medalist um, partake? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I was ever really comfortable, you know, insecure in my understanding of how that corruption happens, right. you know, what that really looks like, what that really feels like, what is that moment? And um, the actor showed me. That was a, uh, uh, an incredible moment, but I'll yeah. tell you, the other incredible moment in that um, scene is when he says, give it back. Mm -hmm. The way he says yeah. it, that's the way. Give that to me. Yeah. Give that to me, exactly. Like there is, you know the degree to, of that guy's addiction mm -hmm. by the way he says it. Mm -hmm. And again, something that the actors brought to that scene. Yeah, and the subservience that's there. I mean, there's, it really is a question of power. Okay. Although by the time we you know, got to shooting the wide of them, you know, the cop car pulling up, you know, to the helicopter by right, the estate, right, right, and then right. that shot of the helicopter taking off. Even before we got to shooting the scene, I realized, oh, uh, there's no way that he resists DuPont, because you, uh, you see what he's being given. That, that, that's how it strikes you as, yeah, like it is part of getting whisked off in a, you know, ten million dollar chopper to you know travel to D.C. from Pennsylvania, which is not that far. It's it's there in that scene. It becomes. It looks like with the hair cutting scene on the porch, mm -hmm. listening to I forget amazing song now. It's Dylan doing Woody Guthrie. Yeah. The implication is that there was a. I mean, this was a twenty four hour kind of obsession between the two of them. Um, but is that true? The film, uh, in truth, um, dials back the intensity of the colorful, spectacular aspects of the story. So the right. cocaine use was, was bigger, and it went on for longer. Why'd you dial it back? Because then it becomes just a drug thing. DuPont's mental illness, though evident in, in the representation in the film, uh, the, the stories were even more disturbing, you know, and it went further. But at some point, they would begin to drown out the other themes mm -hmm. that came before it, mm -hmm. you know, the foundation of the film. Right. And so it was just, uh, you know, for dramatic expediency, mm -hmm. it's just, as much as is needed and not more. A coach is a father. A coach is a mentor. A coach has great power on an athlete's life. How did you get um, to cast Steve as John? You know, when, you're, when, when you make yourself a movie, all of the agencies and agents become aware that, okay, here's, an, here's a movie that's gonna be made, and then agents add names to the lists. And so we had you know, our potential DuPonts, and I don't remember how many names were mm -hmm. ultimately offered for the DuPont list. I, I honestly can't remember, 75, 100 mm -hmm. names, something like that. But Carell's agent, had added his name to the list. And it was not a matter of me thinking, you know who's perfect for this, it's Steve right. Carell. Yeah. It was having Carell's name pop up on you know one of these lists, because it doesn't happen yeah. just once, it's sort of over time, yeah. like you just ask for more names. And yeah. when his name cropped up, I just thought it was interesting and it made a certain kind of sense. And uh, it, if it could work, and I, and I met him, and he showed me another side of himself, and he exhibited a real determination to 
uh, approach this with the seriousness and commitment and devotion mm -hmm. that would be necessary for him to get a performance mm -hmm. like the kind that he gave. And that was it. It was, I just thought, well, the best version of this film is, is if, he can, if he can pull that off, there is not a better version. Now it's done. Mm -hmm. How does it feel? To hear how somebody's relating to the film is, uh, is the thing that makes me think, oh, right, so that's kind of part of why you do it, mm -hmm. you know? And it's, it's, it's really nice seeing how people, React. you know, take in the film. Yeah. And it's, again, back to the issue of the non-conclusiveness. It's, it's, not, it's not giving a message. So our conversation is, did you get my message? Right. Do you agree with the message? Right. Did I change you? Did I turn right. you? It's not that. It's, it's not that. It, it's that, much that. more interesting to, uh, even in the response of the film by people, to get, you know, to even deepen mm. an understanding of some of the things that are, are at work that I think drew all of us into it in the first place. Mm -hmm. If I'm gonna say one thing about your film, I have my own ideas and interpretations, mm -hmm. but at least it was a film that actually allowed me some space to walk into it, look around, yeah. and come up with my own ideas. Yeah. And most other films are just holding you by the hand and take you on a roller coaster. Yeah. So I wanna thank you for that because that was a gift to me. So thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, that's, that's high praise, Eddie, thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Really man. great talking thank to you. you.